As we continue on in our study through the book of Genesis, now we come to Genesis chapter 4, where we're going to take a look at Cain, Abel, and what I call the continuing fall. You'll see what I mean as we get into the text today. Genesis chapter 4, beginning at verse 1, where we read, Now Adam knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. The very first verse of Genesis chapter 4 describes the birth of Cain, the son of Adam and Eve, the first baby ever to exist on planet Earth. And of course, that baby came about in the natural way of humans' relations when it says in verse 1, Now Adam knew Eve his wife. Now, I suppose somebody, if they weren't really familiar with biblical terminology, they might just say, well, didn't Adam know Eve from the very beginning? That was the woman of whom he said, your bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, will come together and be one flesh. Well, of course, Adam knew who Eve was. But in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1, and in many other places in the scripture, that word knew or to know is a polite way of saying that Adam and Eve had sexual relations. That term is often used in the Bible in that sense. I could give you examples in Genesis chapter 4 later on, verses 17 and 25. Uh, Genesis chapter 38, verse 26. Judges chapter 11, verse 39. 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19. Again, it's just a frequent way to politely speak of sexual intimacy to say that a man knows a woman. And if you think about it, it's really a powerful way to describe sex. It shows the high interpersonal terms in which the Bible sees the sexual relationship. Many terms and phrases that people use for sex in the modern world, and I suppose even in century past, they are either coarse or maybe even violent that the Bible sees sex as a way to know one another in a committed relationship. When it says that Adam knew Eve, his wife, it indicates an act that contributes to the bond of unity, to the building up of a true one flesh relationship. Now, we don't exactly know because the scriptures don't tell us, But we really don't have any reason to believe that Adam and Eve did not have sex before this. In other words, there's no real reason to believe that this was the first time, necessarily, that Adam and Eve had sexual intimacy. They were certainly capable of sexual relations before the fall, because there's nothing inherently impure, there's nothing inherently unclean in the sexual act itself, only in its misuse. And that's why God regulates the use of the sexual relationship in a marriage between a man and a woman in a committed, uh, biblically permitted marriage. In any regard, after Adam knew his wife Eve, verse 1 says that she bore Cain, and then she said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now, the name Cain is interesting. The the thought is that it basically meant, I've got him, or here he is. Now, based on the name, again, I've got him, or here he is, and the statement Eve made at Cain's birth, I have acquired a man, or more literally, I have acquired the man from the Lord. I believe it's likely that Eve, and Adam, of course, as well, thought that Cain was the seed of the woman that God promised would be the destroyer of Satan and the deliverer who would come from Eve. That was just back in the last chapter. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God told Satan that there would come as a seed from the woman, a deliverer for humanity, a destroyer of Satan. And therefore, when Cain is born, she said, well, this is the seed of myself. This is the the, the woman. I, I am the woman, rather. This is the seed of the woman. She names Cain 
I've got him, or here he is. And then she says, I've acquired the man from the Lord. It could genuinely be said that Cain was the second Adam. He had the first man, Adam, and then he had the second man, miniature form, but second man, Adam. Now think about that for a moment. Under normal circumstances, parents want good things for their children. They wonder if their children will be destined for greatness. Adam, and I think especially Eve, had those expectations for Cain, but it went further than the normal parental hopes and expectations. Adam and Eve hoped, even expected, that Cain would be the Messiah God promised. Again, put yourself in Adam and Eve's place. God promises them the seed of the woman is going to destroy Satan. Eve has a child. She names him, you know, here's the one. I've acquired the man from the Lord. And Eve thought that she held in her arms the Messiah, the Savior of the whole world. But friends, do you sense the tragedy? You, you know how the story develops, don't you? What Eve held in her arms was really a murderer, not the Messiah. Okay, let's continue on, uh, starting at verse 2 here of Genesis chapter 4. Then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. Well, verse 4 tells us that Abel, the brother of Cain, the second born to Adam and Eve, Abel was a keeper of sheep. He tended flocks, herds of sheep and presumably goats. But Cain was a tiller of the ground. But both of these men had employment. They had work to do. Uh, agriculture, the domestication of animals. This was practiced among the very earliest of humans. Adam and his descendants did not spend tens of thousands of years living as hunter-gatherer cave dwellers. It's very likely that at certain times and places, and maybe immediately after the flood, humanity lived in that way. But there was domestication of animals and agriculture in the generation of Adam and Eve. In any regard, we read in verse 3 that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. Now we can surmise that Cain brought this offering to the tree of life. Because the cherubim guarded the way to the tree of life. That's back in Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. Cherubim are always associated with the dwelling place of God or a meeting place with God. We see that especially in the later tabernacle and the temple. It's possible, I wouldn't say it's certain, but it's possible that Cain, Abel, and later others met with God at the tree of life, where the cherubim guarded access to the tree, and of course they present, prevented anyone from eating its fruit. Well, wherever specifically they brought this offering, they brought it before the Lord. And we read there in verse 4 that the Lord respected Abel and his offering. And then verse 5 says, he did not respect Cain and his offering. Abel brought an offering from the flock. It says, the firstborn of his flock. And that was obviously a bloody offering, a, a, a sheep. Uh, goat would be sacrificed from the flock. Cain brought an offering of vegetation. Verse 3 describes it as the fruit of the ground. Now, there's a lot of people when they compare the offering of Abel, that was a blood sacrifice from the flock, and the offering of Cain, that was a offering of vegetation, many people assume that that was the difference between their offerings. Now, that was a difference between their offerings, but that was not the crucial difference between their offerings. As if God was accepting grain, uh, blood offerings, but God was not accepting grain offerings. Friend, when you go later on in the third book of Moses, the book of Leviticus, you'll see that God 
accepted grain offerings. They were acceptable before God, uh, though not, of course, as atonement for sin. But we don't have any direct indication that this offering that they brought to the Lord was an offering for atonement for sin. It could have been a fellowship offering. It could have been a dedication offering. As a matter of fact, the writer to the Hebrews, that's later on in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews, he clearly explained why the offering of Abel was accepted and the offering of Cain was rejected. This is what it says in Hebrews 11.4. By faith, Abel offered up a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. You see, Cain's offering was really the effort of dead religion, while Abel's offering was made in faith, in a desire to worship God in spirit and in truth. That was the difference between their offerings, not fundamentally that then was an animal sacrifice and the other one was a grain or a vegetable sacrifice. In any regard, verse 4 tells us that Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. That shows that Abel's offering was extra special. The fat of the animal was prized as its luxury, and that was to be given to God when the animal was sacrificed. You'll see references to that in Leviticus chapter 3 and in Leviticus chapter 7. The burning of fat in sacrifice before God was called a sweet-smelling aroma to the Lord in Leviticus chapter 17, verse 6. Now, I don't have much doubt that the offering of Cain was no doubt more aesthetically pleasing. It was more pleasant to look at. You, you know, you think of a nice arrangement, you know, sort of a, of a fruit arrangement, a fruit basket. There it is. It's lovely. It's organized. It looks almost like a, a floral arrangement. You bring that to the Lord and it looks beautiful. Abel's offering? Look, let's be honest. It would have been a bloody mess. But God is more concerned with faith in the heart than he is with artistic beauty. Abel brought his offering. Cain brought his. One more thing about Abel's offering. Here, it was one lamb. I'm going to assume it was a lamb. It could have been a goat. It just says it was of the flock. But here, it was one lamb for a man. Abel, one man, he brought one lamb, presumably. Later, at the Passover... In the book of Exodus, it would be one lamb for a family. Then on the Day of Atonement, detailed later in the book of Exodus and the book of Leviticus, it would be one lamb for the nation. Finally, with Jesus, it was one lamb who took away the sin of the whole world. That's what John the Baptist said of Jesus when he first laid eyes on him, when John was out doing his work of baptism. He said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, when it comes to the offerings that Abel and Cain brought, the Lord, verse 4, says, respected Abel's offering. Verse 5 says that he did not respect Cain's offering. We don't precisely know how Cain and Abel knew that their sacrifices were accepted or not accepted. Seemingly, there was some outward evidence that made it obvious. There are some biblical examples of having an acceptable sacrifice consumed by fire from God. This happened in the case of Gideon, in the case of David, in the case of Solomon, and a few others, uh, Elijah in the book of 2 Kings, or 1 Kings, rather. Perhaps an acceptable sacrifice brought to the cherubim at the Tree of Life was consumed by fire from heaven or maybe from the flaming swords of the cherubim. Genesis chapter 3, verse 24 says that the cherubim had flaming swords. But verse 5 tells us that Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. You could say that Cain's anger was rooted in pride. He couldn't bear that his brother was accepted before God and that he was not. It's even possible that it was public knowledge. Now, you could say that at that time, there may have only been four people on the earth. Adam and Eve had sons and daughters afterwards, so maybe some of them were around. But let's just say there were four people on the earth at that time. But whatever public there were, it could have been public knowledge. And perhaps, we can't say this for certain, but perhaps everybody saw that Abel's sacrifice made with faith 
was accepted by God, consumed by fire. Cain's offering, not made with faith, was not consumed by fire. And if you picture that situation, again, we understand it's a bit speculative, but if there Cain is waiting for some outward manifestation that his sacrifice was acceptable to God, if it was fire to consume the sacrifice and it didn't come, he would have been embarrassed. And so now you could say that the epidemic of sin quickly became worse. The first sin described in the Bible is the sin of taking something that one should not take, eating something that one's commanded not to eat. That's what Adam and Eve did in the Garden of Eden. Now, of course, they added sins on top of that. They hid from God. They lied to God. They blamed one another. But here, the second sort of specific sin, or maybe we should say the sinner mentioned Cain, he's committing the relatively sophisticated sins of spiritual pride and hypocrisy. Now, because of that, God gave a warning to Cain. Look at verses 6 and 7. That's where we read, So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. Now, God point blank asked Cain, why are you angry? Why has your countenance fallen? Look, look, let's understand something. Whenever God asks such a question, it's not that God doesn't know the answer. Of course God knows the answer. God asks such question for the benefit of the person to whom he is asking the question. And God is dealing with Cain in terms of loving confirmation. He's not automatically affirming Cain. No, he's saying, Cain, I need to confront you over your sin. You're angry, but you don't have a reason. Your countenance has fallen, but it's not right. He wanted Cain to know and to resist this pull towards anger and violence that was within him. Now, in verse 7, the Lord told Cain, if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. God warned Cain about the destructive power of sin. Cain could resist sin and find a blessing in that, or he could give in to sin and therefore be devoured. Matter of fact, the Lord told Cain in verse 7 that sin, sort of making sin to be a person, uh, personifying it, he said, and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. We prevent sin from ruling over us by allowing God to master us first. If God is not first our master, we will be slaves to sin. And we could say that this is true for every one of us. Sin's desire is for us. But with the power of God and submitted to God, we should rule over it. That's not how it worked out with Cain. If you look at verse 8, this is what we read. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. What a, what a sobering verse, verse 8 is. The sense is that Cain planned to catch Abel by surprise. He talked with his brother. And while they were in the field, that's when Cain rose up against Abel and killed him. This shows that not only Cain killed Abel, which would be bad enough, of course, but there was a premeditated aspect to it. He clearly ignored the way of escape that God offered to him. Friends, what we read in verse 8 is so sobering because no human had ever died before on the earth. No human had ever been killed before, but now Cain saw that how animals were killed for sacrifice, now he extinguished Abel's life in a similar way. I imagine, and friends, this is just imagination, of course, 
but Cain watching Abel sacrifice that lamb, if it was in fact a lamb, again, it could have been a goat, but sacrificing that lamb before the Lord and seeing how that, that being that was once full of life the being that walked and bleated and ate and did whatever else that lambs do. That that being, after Abel presumably slit its jugular vein and drained the blood out, that that lamb died. Now the same thing had happened to Abel himself at Cain's hand. This shows us that the downward course of sin among the young human race progressed quickly. The hoped for Redeemer. Remember what we said at the very beginning, that the hopes, the expectations that Eve had for Cain. He's the one. I've acquired the man from the Lord. She hoped that he would be the Messiah, but now the hoped for Redeemer was found to be a murderer. And her second son was the victim of murder. You know, whenever you or I, we, we sin in a significant way, usually there's something in our conscience that says, no, you got to stop doing that. you, you got to do better. Come on now. And hopefully we're trusting God for strength and power. We're confessing our sin. But there's just something in us that says, whoa, that was bad. i got to do better now. We think we can sort of nip sin in the bud, keep it from getting worse. But sin wasn't stopped at the root. Man's moral condition did not quickly improve after Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. Sin in the human condition could not be contained. Now, afterwards, in verse 9, we see that God confronted Cain. He questioned him. Verse 9, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Again, we come back to it again. God knew the answer to the question. He asked Cain because he wanted to give him the opportunity to confess his sin. He wanted to give Cain the opportunity to start to do right after having done wrong, which is important, isn't it? I mean, if you're in a wrong course, it's better to immediately change that wrong course and to begin doing right. But Cain didn't do that. How futile it was for Cain to lie to God. Where's Abel, your brother? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? It was madness for him to think that God didn't know where Abel was or that he could hide his sin from God. But friends, isn't it true that sin makes us a little crazy? We think we can get away with things that there's no getting away with. Whether our sin is made public or not, it's known before God. But Cain was evasive with the question, where's Abel, your brother? He answered in verse 9, am I my brother's keeper? That reply of Cain is somewhat famous. It's sort of, am I supposed to care about my brother? Am I have watch over my brother? And the fact of the matter was that he was supposed to be his brother's keeper. But instead, he was his brother's murderer. And he murdered him for the lowest of reasons. Friends, Abel had not injured Cain in any way. Cain's murderous rage was inspired by purely by spiritual jealousy. God accepted you, and he didn't accept me. I'm jealous. In a sermon on this passage, Charles Spurgeon expressed his shock, his dismay, at the way that Cain replied to God. Let me give you this quote from Charles Spurgeon here. He says, quote, The cool impudence of Cain is an indication of the state of heart which led up to his murdering his brother, and it was also a part of the result of his having committed that terrible crime. He would not have proceeded to the cruel deed of bloodshed if he had not first cast off the fear of God and been ready to defy his Maker. 
Friends, that's a dangerous thing to cast off the fear of God, to be ready to defy the Lord. The book of Jude, verse 11, warns of the way of Cain, which I would say, at least in some respect, is unbelief. It's empty religion that leads to jealousy, that leads to the persecution of the truly godly. You could even say that it leads to murderous anger. Friends, you could say that Cain was a religious man. He brought a sacrifice to the Lord. Now, his sacrifice wasn't accepted, but he brought a sacrifice to the Lord. Cain was, in some respect, a religious man. But there is no greater curse on the earth than empty, vain religion. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5 warns of those who have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God. There are many people in the world today who are afraid of secular humanism or atheism. But dead religion sends plenty of people to hell all on its own. Oh, I'm not saying that there's no danger, there's no threat from secular humanism or atheism or whatever else you want to call it. But don't ever underestimate the danger of dead religion. Now, continuing on, starting at verse 10. And he said, this is the Lord speaking, and he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you are cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it shall no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Striking words from the Lord in verse 10, where he says to Cain, The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The idea of a victim's blood crying out to God from the ground is later repeated in the Bible. Matter of fact, in Numbers chapter 35, starting at verse 29, it describes how the blood of unpunished murderers defiles the land. And because the voice of Abel's blood cried out to the Lord from the ground. Now, verse 11 says that the Lord told Cain, so now you are cursed from the earth. The curse upon Cain was that Adam's curse would be amplified regarding him. You see, the Lord told Adam that He would bring forth food from the earth in difficulty. That's in Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 and 18. But it would be impossible for Cain, who was a farmer. If Adam and Eve were driven from Eden, that's in verse 24 of Genesis chapter 3, Cain would find no resting place over all the earth. As verse 12 says, a fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. In response to this strong word from the Lord, Cain complained to the Lord about the severity of God's judgment. Verse 13 and 14 reads like this, And Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. Cain didn't feel bad about his sin, but only about his punishment. He tells the Lord, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Friends, that attitude did not end with Cain. Like him, there are many people who feel only bad about their punishment. They don't feel bad about their sin. Donald Gray Barnhouse, in his commentary on Genesis, said this, quote, One of the consequences of sin is that it makes the sinner pity himself instead of causing him to turn to God. One of the first signs of new life is that the individual sides with God against 
himself. But that's not how it was for Cain at this point. Now, God responded to Cain in verse 15. And the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. As significant as God's judgment against Cain was, God did not want Cain to be killed by others. Now, this is interesting, because later in God's law, specifically in the days of Noah, God prescribed that murderers should be executed. But God said no in the case of Cain, and probably, if I could say, it was probably a purely practical measure, because the population of the earth was precariously low anyway. So God said no. Whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And to sort of identify Cain, it says in verse 15 that the Lord set a mark on Cain. God set an identifying and protective mark upon Cain. Through the centuries, some people have speculated they know what the mark of Cain was. Let me just say, nobody really knows what this mark upon Cain was. And certainly, whatever it was, it was not passed on to his descendants. That brings up the issue of Cain and his descendants. Let's take a look at verses 16 and 17, Genesis chapter 4, where we read, Then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod, on the east of Eden. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. Then he built a city and called the name of the city after his son, Enoch. As we saw in the very first verse of Genesis chapter 4, we find this phrase, and Cain knew his wife. Now, this brings up one of the classic questions that comes up among people who are just reading the Bible or trying to figure out the Bible. I do a weekly question and answer program on YouTube, and this question comes up a lot. People want to know, where did Cain get his wife? Was there some other creation happening on another part of the world that we're not told about? No, friends. Cain obviously married his sister. Now, if that makes your jaw drop, if that's scandalous to you, it's true that marrying a sister was against the law of God according to its later revelation. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 9. Chapter 18, verse 11. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 17. Deuteronomy chapter 27, verse 22. Which even prohibits the marrying of a half-sister. That was long before God spoke that law. Or excuse me, this was long before God spoke that law to Moses and to the world. Here, necessity simply demanded that Adam's sons marry his daughters. Now, some people rightly wonder about this. They say, well, wait a minute. Wouldn't that mean a lot of uh, genetic abnormality, a lot of uh, malformation among the children born to people who came together in a sexual relationship, brothers and sisters came together in marriage in that way. Well, no, and I'll tell you the most reasonable explanation. We don't know for certain, but here's a reasonable, at least in my mind, explanation of this. At this point, the gene pool of humanity was pure enough to allow close marriage, or the marriage of close relatives, without the harm of inbreeding. But just as a stream gets more polluted, the further it flows from the source, there came a time where the genetic pool of humanity was corrupted enough where God decreed that there no longer be marriage between close relatives because of the danger, genetically speaking, that comes from inbreeding. But even in the days of Abraham, God allowed marriage between a half-brother and sister. Abraham married his half-sister, Sarah. And God did not prohibit such marriages until the time of Moses. Again, Leviticus chapter 18, verse 9. 
Marrying a brother or sister was not forbidden until God forbade it. And when he did forbid it, then it was forbidden. Now, Cain not only married his sister, but he also, verse 17 tells us, that he built a city. Here we see the beginning of industry and of urbanization. From the beginning, it was strongly man-centered. Look at what Cain named his city. He called the name of the city after the name of his son. In other words, he didn't call the city something that would honor God or glorifying to God. It wasn't like, let's say, the later city in Israel, Bethel, house of God. No, he called it after the name of his son, Enoch. Friends, that's man-centered. It's not God-centered. You could say that these are small but significant indications that the fall of the human race continued. You could even say that it increased. Now, let me clarify something. We hear that this son of Cain was named Enoch. This is not the same Enoch as the later one in Genesis chapter 5. We'll see that next time we take a look at Genesis chapter 5. The name Enoch is said to mean dedicated. One could say that Cain's son Enoch was dedicated to man, and the later Enoch of Genesis chapter 5 was dedicated to the Lord. Now, let's begin at Genesis chapter 4, verse 18. We're going to take a look at the generations following Cain. Verse 18, to Enoch was born Erad, and Erad begot Mehuhel, and Mehuhel begot Methuselah, and Methuselah begot Lamech. Then Lamech took for himself two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other one was Zilha. And Ada bore Jabal. He was the father of those who dwelt in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harps and flute. And as for Zilha, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nama. We read in verse 18 that to Enoch was born Erad. The picture here in these verses is one of rapid advancement. Succeeding generations quickly made progress in areas such as the founding of a city, that's what Cain did, then in home building, that's where uh, verse 20 comes in, in music and the arts, it says one of these was the father of all those who play the harp and flute, and even in metalworking, someone being an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. Now, the idea that mankind advanced very quickly goes against most modern theories. But let's remember, archaeology can only evaluate on the basis of what is preserved, and therefore archaeology is somewhat speculative. Now, I don't say that to depreciate the archaeologist. God bless the archaeologist. Hey, dear Mr. or Mrs. Archaeologist, keep digging. Keep doing your work. As you continue to do your work, you confirm the truth of the biblical account. But, but again, we remember there are natural inborn limitations to archaeology. And so where there might be some place where archaeology does not yet seem to confirm the biblical account, it does not bother me. I hope it doesn't bother you. But it does not bother me. I just say to the archaeologist, keep digging, keep doing your work. Verse 18 in this passage tells us that Methusahel begot Lamech. Now, the name Lamech may mean to make low or one who strikes down in the sense of being a conqueror. He was the sixth one from Adam on Cain's side. And Lamech's arrogance we read about what he says there in the passage, verses 23 and 24. We'll read about that in just a moment. But Lamech's arrogance is a contrast to the godliness of Enoch, who was the sixth from Adam in Seth's line. Uh, he's noted to be that in Jude, verse 14. In any regard, verse 19 tells us that Lamech took for himself 
two wives. Lamech was the first bigamist in history, going against God's original plan for one man and one woman to become one flesh. Again, that's in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24. And Jesus referenced back to that, saying, from the beginning that was the case, in Matthew chapter 19, verses 4 through 8. And the names of his wives and his daughter show this emphasis in the heart of Lamech. You see, the name of his wife, Ada, can mean pleasure, ornament, or beauty. The name of his wife, Zilha, can mean shade, probably referring to the luxurious covering of her hair. His daughter's name was Nama, which can mean loveliness. You see, these indications that Lamech's culture, his world, was committed to physical and outward beauty, which we understand are blessings and gifts from God, but they're not things to center a culture around. We also see Lamech's boastful uh, attitude in verses 23 and 24, where we read, Then Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. The way that Lamech, and again, his name may mean something like conqueror, the, the way that Lamech the conqueror boasted about his murder of another, and the way that he believed that he could promise a greater retribution than God promised, it shows a progressive degeneracy among humanity. Things quickly became worse with the human race. This was a true devolution. Listen, Cain murdered a man, but he felt terrible about it. He tried to hide it. Lamech murdered a man, if he's to be believed in his account, and he boasted about it. Friends, the human race fell in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. It kept falling. Man went from bad to worse to worser -er. I'm making up a word there, but I hope you get the idea. Matter of fact, this is what Lamech said, verse 24. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. And this is all a representation of what we might call humanism, a man-centered perspective. The only city was Cain's city. The focus of Lamech was his beautiful wives and his own perceived strength. But for all of Lamech's boasting, neither he nor his descendants are ever heard of again in the Bible. Lamech, for all of his boasting, came to nothing. Now, verses 25 and 26, we read, and Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. And as for Seth, to him also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Adam and Eve had many children who were not specifically named in the biblical record, but Seth was worthy of mention because he, in some sense, replaced Abel. And he was the one to whom the promise of a deliverer from the seed of the woman would be passed. You see, we found out that Cain was not the seed of the woman that God promised. He was utterly disqualified. He wasn't the Messiah. He was a murderer. Well, if Cain did not carry the line of the seed of the woman, then who did? Well, it was his brother Seth born after him. And in the days of Seth and his son Enosh, verse 26 says, then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Even in those wicked days, the worship of God was not unknown. 
Some people have called Genesis chapter 4, verse 26, again, where it says, Then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Some people have called that the first revival, because it is the first indication of a spiritual resurgence after a clear decline. And in some sense, that's what revival is. It's a wonderful thing that men began to call on the name of the Lord. But what will happen as the biblical rec record continues, well, we're going to have to get into that the next time we get into Genesis chapter 5. But before we end our time in Genesis chapter 4, let's ask ourselves the question, how does Genesis chapter 4 point to Jesus Christ? That's always a good question to ask whenever you're reading the Bible, in particular the Old Testament, because oftentimes it's easier for us to see directly how the New Testament points to Jesus. Of course, it's the New Testament. But how does the Old Testament, how does Genesis 4 point to Jesus Christ? Well, I'm sure we could come up with many ways, but let me suggest one way. It's in three contrasts that we see. Number one, Jesus can be contrasted with Cain. Think of Cain, Adam's firstborn, who was the second Adam. He was thought to be the prophesied one who turned out to be a murderer. What a contrast he is to the true second Adam, Jesus Christ. Cain took life. Jesus came to give life and to give it more abundantly. Then secondly, you can contrast Jesus with Lamech. Think again of Lamech. Strong, bold, boastful, arrogant. The name Lamech basically means low. Now, most everyone thinks that his name means one who makes others low or one who strikes others down. Uh, they think the name Lamech means a conqueror. But what a contrast that is to Jesus Christ. No being who has ever walked this earth had reason to boast more than Jesus. Nobody was ever more powerful than Jesus Christ. Lamech boasted of his puny power. But Jesus had real power and authority. Yet Jesus said of himself, I am gentle and lowly in heart. That's Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Jesus was not only lowly, but he was not afraid to be lowly. He lived out the truth that the greatest in God's kingdom is actually the servant of all. And then for our third contrast, we have Jesus contrasted with Cain, Jesus contrasted with Lamech. Now finally, let's contrast the blood of Jesus with the blood of of Abel. Genesis chapter 4 verse 10 said that the blood of slain Abel spoke, and it spoke of judgment. It cried out for vengeance. The blood of Jesus also speaks, but the blood of Jesus speaks of better things. The blood of Jesus speaks of grace and our sin having been judged. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24 says that we have come to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Friends, the blood of Abel spoke, but it cried out for judgment against sinners. The blood of Jesus spoke, crying out for mercy and grace to be given to sinners. Friends, both the blood of Abel and the blood of Jesus speak, but the blood of Jesus speaks of better things. And let's thank God for that. So friends, that's where we're going to end it here with our look at Genesis chapter 4. I hope you apply these things to your heart and let the better speaking of the blood of Jesus resound in your heart. Father, that's my prayer for all those who watch or listen to this, that they would look to Jesus, the true son of Adam, the second Adam, and that they would receive the better things that the blood of Jesus speaks of. Lord, Abel was slain, but not voluntarily. 
It was murder. Jesus was slain. And though it was murder on the part of man, it was voluntary on the part of Jesus Christ. It was all part of your great plan, and we're so grateful that the blood of Jesus speaks of better things than that of Abel. We want to live and walk in the great forgiveness and grace that the blood of Jesus, his sacrifice on our behalf, brings to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.